Uh, that was kind of my next question is what, what's the driver then to have your own versus move to public cloud? Like, right. Okay. Move to public cloud. If you do it right. And there's a lot of caveats here in theory, you could save some money. Um, but as you look at why people would not go to public cloud and why you said, Hey, you're probably always going to have your own, especially if you're a large organization, why would you keep things around? There's a really interesting episode of the uh, Kubernetes podcast, um, different podcast. Sorry, I'm, I'm showing mm -hmm. one on yours. Um, but they, <laughs> right. they had an episode on the economics of uh, basically cloud computing. Um, and they had somebody on as a guest who was explaining that there's like a, a certain percentage of hardware efficiency, uh, hardware utilization, and then labor efficiency that you have to hit in order to make it worth it to run on premises at scale. So um, I don't remember the exact numbers. Um, actually, I have them here. They, uh, yeah, you need to you need to have over sixty percent utilization of your on-premises hardware and over thirty percent labor efficiency of those engineers maintaining that infrastructure um, in order to to make it worth it to run at scale on-premises. So for a lot of companies, I think moving to cloud just makes sense because you're not, a lot of companies aren't hitting those metrics, that 60% utilization and things like that. Yeah, in the past, I, I would found that often people would get twitchy if you got over 50% utilization on the hardware because they weren't sure they'd size things appropriately. And cloud sort of pays that over because it says it doesn't matter if you didn't size it appropriately because you can just get more and you can get it more immediately and that's a that's a pretty big difference now one thing i'm curious about is because I'm, I'm sure you interact with the physical infrastructure team even if you're not part of it have they started to move to a private cloud operational thing so they can get that 30 percent efficiency um as far as i know yeah um i i mean there's a um i think they they're working to use tools like uh openstack um, to make sure that we have kind of like an agnostic framework for building, um, you know, infrastructure, whether or not it's on public cloud or private cloud. Um, but uh, I also know that, um, you know, Bloomberg has adopted Kubernetes, fairly early adopter of Kubernetes. Um, mm -hmm. And there's been some, some case studies that have been published um, for the data science team at Bloomberg. We were able actually to get over 90% hardware utilization um, wow. using Kubernetes for their data science. So there've been some, some really good gains there. So, yeah. so I'm going to be a child and ask, uh, did they run Kubernetes to keep OpenStack up? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell you that, but I think it was more for, for uh, scaling and, and making it easy for, for the data science team to, to yeah. run their, um, you know, use Kubeflow to run ML models and stuff like that. Uh, it's interesting that there are different projects that, that OpenStack has a use case for, because it's, it's, it's funny, even that as that project has matured, you just don't hear about it as much anymore, because there aren't constant new releases and, and new things happening. It's just there's people running it, they're running it quietly, you don't hear much about it, and Kubernetes is the new hotness. Everybody's excited about that when you're doing something with Kubernetes. But I, wanna, I just want to qualify what you just said there. In, in the Kubernetes-related projects that you're talking about, you said, again, 90% uh, hardware utilization. Uh, using Kubernetes as the orchestrator to bring it to 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 manage that uh, that hardware in that cluster. Yeah, at least specifically for that um, that team, that application, the data science uh, team that had going there, they were able to achieve that level of utilization, which is re really impressive. Although I think a part of that's going to be not just Kubernetes, it's going to be how the application was architected because Kubernetes is only you know, standing up containers uh, and so on. So th there is an implication that the app was able to be used by Kubernetes in such a way to get that level of utilization. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but Kubernetes does help since you can, you can pack, uh, you know, instead of having one VM and then one application running on that VM, you're able to pack a single VM with as many containers as the orchestration system can fit in there based off of their resource requests. Um, so it, it, it's not necessarily a, a thing that if you use Kubernetes, you will see these massive yeah. gains in, in utilization, um, but it can help, uh, especially um, by using it. Right, I think of sort of the fact that if you were running VMware before, it had an orchestration component that would move move VMs as needed and also try to spin up things. Uh, but you were you were limited to the size of a VM, which is much bigger 
than the size of a container. So you've you've shrunk down that unit of expansion, and now you can kind of plug it in all these places where a full VM might not fit anymore. Yeah, and throw uh, automatic, you know, like horizontal auto scaling into that, and cluster auto scaling, and and now it makes it a lot easier to uh, try to always operate at a higher level of utilization than, you know, normal, like you said before, Ethan, that people were, uh, you know, balking at 50% utilization. Now you can have a much higher percentage threshold be your normal. Right. So since we're on the Kubernetes train, uh, I'll just keep going with that a little bit. It sounds like you're running it on premises. Are you also running Kubernetes in the cloud? And if so, are you doing it in a managed capacity using something like EKS or AKS? Or are you sort of managing your own clusters? Yes to all of the above. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So why would you choose to use one of the managed solutions versus building your own cluster? Um, Mostly, I think it's just because we don't necessarily want to have to spend the time to be cluster operators. Um, If you can use one of these managed services, um, you still get a lot of the benefits of using Kubernetes, but without having to manage and operate the control plane, um, which can save you a lot of headache. Right. Sort of the same reason that you use cloud, (laughs) because you're not responsible for the control plane. What would be a situation where you would use build your own cluster instead of uh instead of going with one of the managed services Uh, i think we're moving a little bit more towards defaulting towards a managed service um and and i think for um you know most of the cloud services in general um we want to provide use an option that will be at least an equivalent is available on other clouds um so trying to avoid vendor lock-in to an extent, but as long as there's an alternative available uh, on, on a competing cloud, um, that's okay. And if there's not, then we'll probably, you know, use a, an open source or run our own. But that's interesting because in, in a certain degree, Kubernetes has been held up as the panacea for multi-cloud. Oh, look, you want to do multi-cloud? Well, well you can do <laughs> Kubernetes everywhere, but then you look at the managed versions and sometimes they do weird things. <laughs> so I can see wanting to run your own if you really want that true multi-cloud experience. Yeah, there's nuances with all of the, the managed services uh, that can make it difficult to, to have this truly agnostic framework, Um, you know, with EKS, even just like the authentication scheme is integrated with AWS IAM. Um, That's something that's different than than other versions of Kubernetes that you run yourself or with the other managed services. Um, So it's, it's, you know, trading off, how much vendor lock in are you comfortable with? (laughs) (laughs) We were talking to some folks yesterday, and uh, one of them uh, made the point Kubernetes is the wrong choice in almost all circumstances, but when you need it, you really need it. It's really the right thing. Does that sound about right to you, James? Um, I don't know if I would go as far as saying it's the wrong choice in almost all circumstances, but I do think it is is probably being a little bit over prescribed at the moment um, that a lot of applications don't need the, the, the crazy overhead of this orchestration system when a simple you know, VM with an auto scaling group, or even just like a single machine, or, or you know, just like a, a group of machines and high availability will, will do the trick. Um, you don't necessarily always need the containers. Um, when you add something like Kubernetes, it's, it's not simple. It's not a simple framework. It's yep. very complex. And the tooling around it is complex. And so you're adding a lot of overhead, um, just to the mental model of how everything's working alongside the actual complexity of, um, you know, running your application like that. 